Western leaders have vowed to hold Russians accountable for alleged war crimes in Ukraine. But while tough talk is welcome, my guest says that the current priority must be to protect the Ukrainian population from further crimes against humanity. Peter Dickinson is the Ukraine Alert editor at the Atlantic Council. He's also the chief editor of the Business Ukraine magazine and joins us from the Czech Republic. Peter, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. You write that the scale of Russia's crimes in Ukraine is sadly not surprising. Why are you not surprised? Well, if we look at the rhetoric that's been coming out of the Kremlin for the last few years, never mind the last few months, um, it's pretty much explicitly genocidal. Um, Vladimir Putin has consistently said he does not recognize Ukraine's right to exist. He regards Ukrainians as Russians. Uh, he doesn't think that Ukraine is a legitimate country. He believes Ukraine is established on what he calls historically Russian lands. And he has taken, in fact, in the last year to referring to Ukraine in public as an, an anti-Russia, uh, sort of a, a, an existential threat to Russia. Um, so, and then, of course, we have the entire narrative that Ukrainians are Nazis somehow, despite the fact they have a, a, a democratic system, a democratically elected Jewish presidents uh, and far-right groups are marginalized in Ukraine. The, in the last parliamentary election, far-right groups collectively came together because they've, they've historically done so poorly in elections and they only managed to get 2%. So the idea of some sort of a far-right uh, uh, threat from Ukraine is nonsense, but it seems to play very well in Russia. So we see a country where the people are being told Ukrainians are Nazis, they're enemies, and their country has no right to exist. But Peter, uh, aren't, isn't the Russian population sophisticated enough not to believe the, the propaganda? Um, well, unfortunately, I think there is a certain desire to believe it. I mean, there's a long history of this. This didn't begin under Vladimir Putin. For, for centuries, Russians have been encouraged to see Ukrainians as a, a sort of subgroup of Russians. Uh, Ukrainians are the closest of the many nations to Russia within the broader Russian empire. Uh, Putin, recent, in recent, over the last decade, has talked a lot about the so-called Russian world, by which he means the greater Russia beyond the boundaries of today's modern Russian state. Uh, and, and many Russians share this sense that Russia has been uh, the victim of a grave injustice after the collapse of the Soviet Union because so many ethnic Russians and other people who regard who they regard as Russians, mere, often merely by the fact that they speak Russian, uh, were cut off from 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 modern Russia. So there is a great there's a, there's a very deeply ingrained sense of resentment in in Russian society about the Soviet collapse, and a lot of that comes out in, in aggression towards Ukraine, unfortunately. So let's talk about U.S. support for Ukraine. Do you think the Pentagon is sending the right weapons, the ones that Ukraine needs right now? Well, when the war began and in the lead up to the war, the America was one of the leading nations in terms of supplying Ukraine with weapons. They, they provided a number of, uh, of very important shipments. Uh, in particular, I think the most important, without any question, would be the Javelin anti-tank weapons that were supplied in large numbers. They've had a, a major impact on the course of the first month of the war. They've allowed Ukraine to inflict pretty shocking uh, uh, costs on the Russian invasion force and and win the battle for Kiev. Uh, Russian forces have actually, after having advanced on Kiev in the first days of the war, they've since retreated and have pulled out of that. They've pulled their forces out completely from north of the north of uh, Ukraine. And that is largely because they've been forced to do so by the defeats they've suffered uh, at the hands of Ukraine, partly because of the weapons Ukraine has had from America. However, now, now Ukraine needs to move beyond the kind of ambush tactics, insurgency type tactics that they've been using to this point very effectively. They need to fight a conventional war. They need to push Russia out of areas that the Kremlin currently controls in the east and the south. And in order to do that, they need heavy weapons. They need so-called offensive weapons. That means tanks, missile systems, aircraft, helicopters, uh, and artillery, which they don't, they're not yet receiving, which they, need, they desperately need to receive from America and other partners. But, you know, the White House and Congress have been very reluctant to send offensive weapons for fear of escalation. I mean, isn't that a legitimate fear? Well, a lot of people in Ukraine would say no. Uh, I think, I think uh, you know, the, the, the narrative that we're hearing quite often these days from Ukraine is like the, the, they're questioning the entire notion of, of offensive and defensive weapons. They're saying, well, look, we're fighting for our lives here. We're defending our country against a, a clear, you know, a clear and, and obvious criminal invasion and, and the clear intent to, to eradicate our nation. 
anything you give us is defensive in nature. Anything you give us is by by definition defensive. So there's a lot of resistance to that dif that, that 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 definition. Um, fears of escalation. I mean, well, what more will Putin do? I mean, of course, he has the, the nuclear threat is always there, but beyond that, I mean, they're pretty much doing anything. They, they you know, where is the escalation going to come from? Are they going to bomb cities? They're already bombing cities. Are they going to be conducting massacres? They're already conducting massacres. So quite frankly, uh, there's not a lot of patience in Ukraine for talk of, uh, of, of moderation or fear of escalation. You know, does the Ukrainian army, though, have the capacity and the training necessary to put those types of weapons to use? Well, that's a good question. Um, it, it, there are, of course, issues regarding training, regarding the technical aspects of these, uh, of the, of these weapons. Um, I think, in short, it's going to be a challenge in some areas. There are some weapon systems that would be more challenging, that would be more complex to give, um, and there are, there are some that are less so. Uh, Ukrainians in general are extremely fast adapters. Ukrainian society is, is known for having a very strong IT sector and for being very quick to pick up on things. This is pre-war, of course. Um, that's the nature of the society because it's been in such a state of flux for the last last few decades. Um, and that, that applies to the military as well. They've been very quick to pick up on things. They've been very innovative in their use of things like drones in this conflict, things like, you know, and applying the weapons they've already received. So I think they can learn. It would be challenging in some respects. So I think that yeah, certainly uh, accommodations have to be made there. And, and when, the, when the, the American side is looking what to provide, certainly it's a factor to think about how quickly and how effectively these, these, these weapons can be, can be deployed. And Peter, uh, quickly, in the, in the 30 seconds we've got left, what are the chances that Ukraine could defeat Russia militarily? The chances are very good. Um, if they, uh, as Winston Churchill said, give them the tools and they will finish the job. Uh, they have proven themselves to be extremely competent militarily. They've surpassed all expectations. As I mentioned earlier, they've inflicted severe costs on the Russian forces. They forced Russia out, out of northern northern Ukraine. Uh, Russia's Russian forces are now licking their wounds and preparing to, to move uh, their forces to the east. They can win this war if they receive the weapons that they need. And if they don't win this war, uh, the, the, the West will have to fight the conflict later on with much higher costs. So it really makes sense for all parties to arm Ukraine now. All right, Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.